Anthony Amico is a fantasy football analyst who does dynasty content for Establish the Run and projections for football guys. He's a math teacher, a high school defensive coordinator, and there may not be anyone else on earth who likes to bet the NFL draft more. These are his late round perspectives. We DM and stuff a little bit sometimes about prospects, but it's it's nice to see you in the flesh and and talk this out. Yeah, man. Yeah, are you? Uh, you. I know that you you love betting the draft probably more than anyone else. Uh, that I see on Twitter. Are you like? Are you in a phase? Because you do it more than I do. Are you in a phase where like the things that you're hearing? Are you reacting to it strongly, or do you think that we're still in a noise phase? We're recording this on Tuesday for anyone listening. We're recording this on Tuesday, so. We saw 48 hours until a little over 48 hours until the draft. Yeah, I think this is where some of that smoke starts to become fire. Like, I, I think it's a little more legit the week of the draft. So I'm definitely paying attention. And I mean, most of the positions are in. So we're kind of we're, yeah. we're hoping for confirmation bias and then hoping to react on anything that that maybe doesn't go our way. Yeah, yeah. It feels like the whole draft is like coming down to like how teams view J.J. McCarthy. Like at the end of the day, yeah. is that, is that right? Like, do you like, or, or do you think that he's going to jump like a Drake may or, or Jaden Daniels somehow? I mean, I still think he could go too. Yeah. Okay. Like I, I just, I feel like, I don't know, like a 21 year old guy with like advanced, good advanced numbers and like won a national championship. Like, yeah. I mean, is he really going to be out of it? Like, I don't know. Like, I just, right. so that's, I, I feel weird about that too. I know that we're not really, I've, you know, I sent Anthony a, a show sheet and everything and, um, We'll get to all that kind of stuff. But like the McCarthy thing is strange to me because it doesn't feel like he has that bad of a profile. Like, like I, I think that there's like this contingent that just assumes that he's terrible because they didn't throw the ball that much. But if you think about like what a front office would want, he has like the raw skills, like the, the physical, the physique, the build, the, the age is on his side. And I guarantee you the dude interviews well, right? Like he's like, oh, yeah. he's like a football guy. So is that sort of like the perspective that you're coming from with the the potential of JJ McCarthy going top two or top three? Yeah, it's just like a super easy sell. I mean, yeah, this right, is like a guy right. like the report came out like last week that he was like calling recruits and being like, you know, if you want a party, don't come to Michigan. We're yeah, win the right. title. And I'm like, how do you not love that? You right. know, like right, right, yeah, like as, as a football guy. I mean, as like a normal human being, like okay, that's different. But as like a football guy running a football team that's exactly what you want to hear is that kind of thing right Definitely. um anyway so you like you said you and i we've dm'd like a lot through the years especially like early on in my prospect uh model building and stuff like that you were kind of doing the same sort of things and messing around with with numbers and stuff like that and like you were someone that, that i would go to a lot and seeing if you tested this if you looked at this and i remember like this is gonna date ourselves a little bit because like like it's it's a it's a well known metric at this point, but like yards per team pass attempt, like that was one of the big aha moments for me with wide receiver evaluation. That was something that you had introduced me to. I remember talking about it on the show a little bit. This is probably in like 2019, but oh, yeah. um, I'm curious, you know, if anything's changed on your end with your prospecting, the way that you handle all that, and and let everyone else know sort of how you go about the scouting process. Yeah, for me, I try to get a little bit of everything. I mean, I certainly don't consider myself a scout. I mean, I guess I'm not really like, <laughs> like my degree is in math, but I'm not like, you know, I'm a teacher. It's not like my day to day. I'm crunching numbers all day, but like I, I try to get a little bit of everything. So, you know, I am looking at the numbers, the stuff that some of the stuff that you talk about, you know, on, on your written work and on this show. And, um, <sighs> You know, I still want to watch a little bit, and it, it's not like uh, I'm not expecting to see something and be like, "Oh, the, he's the guy!" Like he's, the, you know. But I just want to have a a good sense of like where players win and kind of how they're used, and it's, it's honestly great because I feel like sources like PFF and other places like SIS, like they've charted a lot of this stuff now too, so you can kind of look at it from that angle. So it's really, really helpful, I think, to kind of get everything especially i think this year with the quarterbacks like you know pressure to sack has been like a big deal like we didn't even have that like 10 right. years ago right so i like to get kind of a full view there and then i'm really trying to push everything through 
right now what I'm using are like comp models. So I, I'm not really as much trying to get like a number that just says like player good, player bad. Sure. I, I, I want more to see like a range of outcomes where it's like, okay, like without even paying attention to the, the success, like within the model itself, what players would we tag this player with? And then we can kind of use our own, like, uh, I guess our own insight on like, how, right. well, how do those players turn out? What does that tell me? How does that inform me about this player's range of outcomes? So I'm trying to get as full a picture as I can. And then, you know, at the end of the day, obviously we need to see where these players get drafted and, yeah. um, you know, take from there. You know, you're not, you're not giving yourself enough credit. You're, you're, aren't you a defensive coordinator? Yeah. Like, like, like you, like, you know, football, like, you know, ball, this isn't like a, oh yeah, I'm this, I'm this math teacher that only looks at numbers. Like, you know, ball Amico, like this is, <laughs> this isn't like a, like, you know, a situation where you're just crunching numbers all day long. Like I, I think having that combination, having that knowledge has helped you throughout the years, uh, you know, with this stuff for sure. Or do you, do you have any, any obvious like blind spots with your process and the way that you do things? Do you think? I'm still a little bit of a sucker for like some of these thresholds and, and the breakout stuff, which like, I think it definitely matters, but I am concerned that with like the NIL and all that stuff that it may become less important. And I know you sent a newsletter out about this actually. So yeah. it, it's, I'm glad we're talking about it, but yeah. like, I don't want to miss that. Like, I don't want to be so focused on the stuff that I thought was really good five years ago that like now I'm passing on guys who I shouldn't be passing on. Yeah, I think that's a really good call out. And, and like you said, I sent out that newsletter, talked about how early declare status is becoming rarer in general. We're just not seeing it. And I focus on wide receiver because I think age adjusted stuff is just more important at wide receiver and more interesting at wide receiver. Um, but yeah, I mean, like like we're seeing it this year. All of the early declare wide receivers this year are going to go. I mean, they could go in the top 50, all of them, right? Like, like we're not going to see the Stefan Diggs, the Amon Ross St. Brown, the Gabe Davises of the world who went day three with the early declare status. And I think a lot of that has to do with, like you said, the NIL uh, stuff with the name image and likeness. Um, you know, these guys kind of having reason to stay in school and to continue to make money and then hopefully also improve their draft stock all while doing so. I think the low key thing, though, man, that's like not been brought up enough. I've tried to bring it up on Twitter and like random comments and stuff like that. And I wrote about it in the in the newsletter as well. But, and I would love to hear your thoughts, like transferring, right? Like, like we have, I, I keep going back to Jaden Reed as the example, just because he's easy, but like Reed goes from Western Michigan, takes a year off because he transfers to Michigan state. And back then you had to take that year and now you don't have to take that year. And so when a player, like put yourself in their shoes, right? Like when a player is sitting there contemplating whether or not to declare early for the NFL draft, their out is not just, oh, I could stay here and maybe make a hundred thousand dollars playing ball while also trying to improve my draft stock. Now it's like, Oh, I could just go to another school, maybe perform better. And then obviously improve my draft stock doing that, but I'm continuing to play. I'm not taking a year off. Do you think that that also could end up sort of changing the formula a little bit of what these age adjusted production profiles look like? Yeah, definitely. And, and the part of that too, is that now we're seeing the guys transfer even before like they could possibly declare. I mean, there's guys like that in this class, obviously, right. where it's like didn't produce at all or couldn't get on the field. And then now all of a sudden they go somewhere where there's targets available. And now all of a sudden they have a breakout or you're, they're productive. And it's kind of like, well, what do you make of that? You know, you have to kind of like evaluate where they're coming from and where they went to. And it, it there's a lot of context that I think we have to really be cognizant of with this stuff now. And you know, I, we've always, I think, thought about it. We've always thought about things yeah. like, you know, teammate quality and, and all that stuff. But we're just seeing like way, way more packed. And, and again, we'll stick with receiver, but just like packed receiver rooms um, where, where, where players are leaving. And it's, yeah. it's kind of hard to suss out what that means sometimes. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I was writing up the profiles this year for the prospect guide. And it's like, like literally half the players that I wrote up transferred at one point in their collegiate career. Like, like Roma Dunze is basically the Washington guys are like rarities, uh, or at least, yeah. you know, Roma Dunze was, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, uh, just to see how the landscapes change. And I do think that, you know, we can't be too dramatic in shifting the way that we look at age adjusted production, in my opinion, right? Like at the end of the day, 
someone breaking out as a sophomore is going to be the same as it was 15, 20 years ago. But I do think that we need to be a little bit more open-minded about five-year guys coming out, four-year guys coming out, and uh, you know, basically weighing that those seasons, those later seasons properly, uh, which is why I was excited. Like I didn't even do this on purpose, but the breakout score metric that I created this offseason like really aligns with that because it doesn't necessarily ding a player like Xavier Leggett the same way that it might ding him in another sort of model, like breakout age type model where it's like, oh, the dude, you know, is 23 whenever he finally got his breakout. But if it was a strong enough breakout, like if he really did what he did, uh, you know, uh, his final year, then it doesn't matter as much because it was just that good. This episode is sponsored by Underdog Fantasy. I know a lot of you guys already play over there, but if you don't, you definitely have to check out their best ball drafts. You draft a team, which is honestly the best part of fantasy football, and then that's it. There's no trading, no waiver wire, no lineup setting. Your roster is optimized each week based on player performance. I'm going to be doing a lot of content on best ball this season, so make sure you're signed up and ready to draft for when that content drops. Just head to underdogfantasy.com or download the Underdog Fantasy app. And when you sign up, make sure you use promo code late round to get a deposit match up to $100. That's promo code late round. You've also done a lot of work through the years. I talked about this at the top in predicting just how the draft might unfold, which is why I wanted to do this perspectives episode a little bit earlier in the week so that people could listen to it, you know, before round one. Do you have any tips for listeners on, on sort of what to pay attention to and what to just kind of ignore as noise as we approach the draft? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to like really limit what you listen to because there's just so much out there. So I'm, I'm focused on like, I, I've been calling them like the one seeds this this cycle, but like Albert Breer, Daniel Jeremiah, Charlie Campbell, Todd McShay. Like, yeah, if it doesn't come from one of those four people, I'm not really trying to give it as much attention. And if it does come from one of those four people, I'm trying to pay attention a little more. Um, and, and I think just in general, like the last couple of years, information has been really, really difficult to come by in terms of like, who's going to go where and stuff like that, because the league knows like, a people are gambling on this thing yeah. and like we don't want to have a lack of integrity and also like this is our show you know like how yeah. fun is it when you show up and you already know like what the first few picks are going to be so i think that there's a little bit of mystery there just off the top and then like you know if you're looking at players that aren't going to go on thursday um you know the beast from from dane brugler is like an amazing resource and uh you know jeremiah has his top 150 so it's it's good to, to kind of see like you know, like we'll talk about later in the show, like Johnny Wilson's a guy that I love, but I can only put him so high because it doesn't really seem like anybody else likes him. You know, like yeah, I don't know right. where he's going to get drafted. Right, right. Are you then, do you find yourself like when you are looking at bets with the draft, are you looking at more day one stuff? Is that the, is that the stuff where you feel most comfortable with, or are you using your intuition a little bit and you're able to say, yeah, you know, I know this guy, I, I know the markets are softer with day two, day three, because people just aren't paying attention to those players as much. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's like 95% day one. Cause that's, I mean, that's what most of what's available is. And then yeah. you can get like, you know, like Troy Franklin has like an over under, you know, sure, because, sure. but, but like, I, I don't know even know how to play that because I'm just like, yeah, yeah. as, as l little certainty as there is on day one, there's even less on day two. So I'm kind of like, you know, it, it's hard to play those things with a lot of certainty. Yeah. All right, let's look at, at how you're ranking guys right now. I sent you this DM. I was like, I know that I'm going off your rankings with this and I hate rankings with a passion uh, just because I don't think they give you enough detail. But fortunately, we can at least like have the conversation about the detail. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I want to ask you, you currently have Drake May ahead of Jaden Daniels in your super flex rankings, I guess in regular single quarterback rankings too. The consensus has that flipped. I have Daniels ahead of May as well. Um, so I'm really, really curious to, to hear your uh your why you have may you know ahead of daniels what it is about may that you like yeah i i, I mean and i'll try to be more pro may than than anti daniels just because i that's just generally how i prefer to, to view things but sure. like i i look at drake may as someone who first of all can run and i think that that's like something that i feel like doesn't get mentioned as much with him where he's not going to provide the same rushing ceiling as a Jaden daniels but he could absolutely be in like that next group of players, you know, maybe not quite like a Josh Allen, but 
like old school Andrew Luck, like that kind of, mm-hmm. like you can get some rushing production there. Um, but he, he's also super young. And I think that the age stuff does kind of matter a little bit at quarterback. I mean, if you look at like the five year guys and, and, and again, like, like we said at the top of the show, there's going to be more of those guys coming. Um, I mean, there's like three in this class alone. Uh, but really the only one that's like done really, really well is Joe Burrow. Yeah. And other than that, it's pretty hard to find the guys, you know, like Baker Mayfield was the first pick and he's been like, all right, like he's had his moments, but you know, if you're talking about dudes and like, I, that's really what I'm looking for. Like you really only have Burrow. So, you know, I think that May's age does help him. Um, he's been a multi-year starter, so he still has a lot of experience. Like this isn't like a, a Mitch Trubisky one year situation. Like he's played for two years. Uh, and if you just look at guys who have historically like thrown the ball a decent amount, have a, a high a dot and haven't taken a ton of sacks. It's, it's a, it's a really good list of players. I mean, I, we're talking about guys like you know Herbert and um, a bunch of guys that have been super successful. Now it's also like a very small list. So mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't want to just say like, Oh, like this is like a hundred percent type deal. But um, I, when I look at May, I guess I just feel a little bit better that he's going to hit than someone like Jaden. Um, and I think that the payoff is still going to be quite good. You know, like I, I, the, the payoff for Jaden, I think probably is, is better just because of the rushing. Yeah. But I just find that as a five-year guy, as a skinnier guy, I, I mean, Anthony Richardson got hurt three times last year and he's 30 pounds heavier than, right. than Jaden Daniels. Um, I, I just have some more concerns, I guess, that he's going to pan out. Yeah, not only that, but Daniels is not nearly as good as like a Lamar Jackson at not taking hits. He's more like an RG3. Yeah. That's what Matt Waldman had talked about on Perspectives too, is that he's more like that RG3 type. And that's a little bit frightening as well, you know, with a with a, a smaller frame. Let me ask you this. If like, do you care if Drake May goes to New England and Daniels goes to Washington, which I think we would probably objectively say at this moment, you know, New England could do something crazy in the draft or like trade for someone, what have you. But situationally, I think we'd say that Jaden Daniels would be in the better situation. Would that sway you at all in putting Daniels ahead of May? No, I don't think that those I don't think that those landing spots is, are going to matter to me that much. I think the Minnesota spot yeah. matters yeah. a lot. Like if the draft gets weird and it's like you know Caleb McCarthy, uh, May, and then all of a sudden Minnesota trades up for Daniels, then I'm like, okay, yeah. you know, like this is that's just like so far and away the best spot to me between the receivers and the coaching and the dome, you know, like it's just, then I I would definitely make a change there. Well then let's say this. So we talked about McCarthy already to open up the show. Let's say that McCarthy goes to Minnesota, which actually, you know, he's, that's, he's the favorite, like that's the favorite team for him right now. So let's say McCarthy goes to Minnesota. Is McCarthy your QB two in this class? (laughs) Well, to pull the curtain back a little bit, I mean, Leone, we have him sixth and Leone is already trying to get me to move him down. So I don't, (laughs) I don't think I'm going to be able to get him much higher, but um, yeah, I mean, I think at least like from a tiering perspective, like if I'm looking at rookie drafts now, at least I'm, and I know majority of people are drafting after, but I think most people are viewing it as like, you know, those top three quarterbacks, obviously the receivers, Bowers, and then McCarthy. Yeah. And I think that like, certainly if you're tiering this McCarthy has to get into that group um, just because he's going to have the best chance to succeed. And like at the end of the day, like especially in Superflex, like you need a guy that that's going to be successful. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I also think there's just like, there's so much volatility to quarterback performance that yeah. I would imagine that just strictly from a value perspective. Now you might not be able to be nimble enough to like trade into this in your rookie drafts and stuff. Cause it's really tough to just do that. Right. But like strictly from a value perspective, I would imagine if McCarthy goes to Minnesota, I would rather have him where he would get drafted in rookie drafts than may and Daniels where they get drafted yeah. in rookie drafts. Right. Like I, cause I would, I would imagine that he's still going to go because people have take lock. People just don't like JJ McCarthy. Uh, I've said all along, I think that he's amazing because of, of his uh, first name and, and the eliteness of the first name. Uh, and so look, if I can get a JJ on my squad, I'm going to get a JJ on my squad, Of course. but, but like if, if he gets drafted be in a super flex format be, and let's say even a single tight or a non tight end premium format, uh, if he's getting drafted behind a Brock Bowers in that environment, like to me, you know, obviously tight end premium, maybe a, a little bit of a different beast, but to me in that case, it just seems like McCarthy would be a smash. And I, I think that 
that would end up happening probably a lot and pretty frequently because people just don't like JJ McCarthy. So to me, the big thing with McCarthy as like that pivot, I know we talked about earlier, but like if it's Minnesota, man, I, I really think that he could end up just being like a massive, massive value in these rookie drafts. Can you trade into that? That's a different story, but I do think at the end of the day, he could be a nice value there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he's getting the Zach Wilson treatment, you know, where she's yeah. kind of like, yeah. We don't like this guy, so we're going to push him down. And like, obviously, you know, that kind of proved to be right. But (laughs) I I just think that you can't do that every time and expect it to go the way you want. Right, right. And and look, McCarthy might not even go in the top 10. We have no idea right now. But, you know, if he does, if that does happen, that means that a team bought into the talent. He's walking into a situation where we've seen guys thrive in that system and be very, very effective. And then he obviously has some of the best weapons in the league if he were to go there. So I think that we have to take all of that into consideration. Let's move on to wide receiver. A lot of people have a big three. Some people have a big two. I personally have a big two, but sort of like a like a one B. Like if they're one A's, a Dunes is kind of a one B, but I still don't have them in that tier. How are you looking at the big three of Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Roma Dunes? Is a Dunze part of that tier for you? It's it's kind of tough because I, like you're saying, like I, there's really nothing that I could think of that would make me want to take him ahead of Marvin Harrison or Malik neighbors. Mm -hmm. But I also think he's like clearly better than the next group. So, you know, I think a one B as you described it is probably best. Like, you know, I mean, Marvin Harrison, my gosh, like, is there ever been like more of a, we feel really good about this wide receiver. Like a clean, just a clean profile. Just all the way around. Like take, I mean, it, like, and that's even before you get to the fact that like his dad's all a famer, you know what I mean? Like just yeah. like all like the production and all age of justice stuff is really good with him. So I have a hard time kind of putting anybody ahead of him. Um, I know that neighbors for some teams is, is the first receiver and he's extremely explosive. I think you could argue that maybe his ceiling is a little bit higher. Um, Dunze is just like super solid. Like yeah. everything you read, super solid guy, super solid producer. Like, you know, uh, I don't think that his bust rate is super high. But I also am not sure that he is like in three years, we're saying, oh, he's, he's the top seven dynasty receiver. You yeah. Know? And I, so I think that that kind of knocks him a little bit below those guys. But again, like clearly ahead for me then of like, uh, you know, Brian Thomas or whoever you have next. Is it Dunze spitting out decent comps? And, and I, I want to ask you this too, is sort of a, a deeper question with the comp stuff that you're looking at. But like, you know, you mentioned we, we talked about how age is changing and the breakouts are changing and such. And Adunze has actually, he's not going to be 22 until June, which is good. Uh, yeah. But, you know, he's not an early declare receiver. And when you look at, like, is is declare status part of that comp process for you? Or is it ignoring that more and looking more at age? Yeah, so I include both um, just so that I can get uh, as good a picture as I can. Um, and what makes Adunze tough is just that, like, you do get, you get a lot of different stuff kind of like depending on like where you credit him with a breakout because I'm, I'm still using like that 30%, sure. uh, you know, dominator threshold. And he actually like doesn't get there when yeah. like, you know, like a uh, year two, I think he misses it by like 0.4, like 0.04 or something like something super, super small. Right. Um, so I kind of just ran it twice and I, I, I was cheating a little bit cause I'm like, I mean, everyone thinks this guy's gonna be good. Like there's no way that sure. he's, you know, his ceiling is like the, the worst or, you know, whatever it is. So it, it worked out where the comps obviously get way better when you credit him for the, for the earlier breakout. But the, the numbers were still pretty good, honestly, no matter what, like the guys who were later breakouts and ended up being good. Some of those guys do appear, you know, Eric Decker, uh, Brandon Ayuk, uh, Rashi Rice, um, Jordy Nelson, like you get those comps, in for a Dunze, and then obviously if you cut in with the breakout, a lot of those players get better uh, just because you're, I, I mean, I'm kind of fudging it to make him look a little bit better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the comps kind of like him no matter what, but the picture is obviously way better if you credit him with that earlier breakout. Yeah, look, he, he's a, he's not like the cleanest profile in the world like a Marvin Harrison at the end of the day. Like I, I've said this before in the show, you know, I do think early declare status matters as like a standalone. If you were to only look at early declare status and say, do you want an early declare or a non-early declare? Yeah, take the early declare because draft capital would would hypothetically follow that. But also, you know, and, and the next guy I want to talk about this too, which is Adonai Mitchell, you know, Adunze needed his final season, his senior season 
to really give us like the big, big year, at least from like a yards per team pass attempt standpoint. Right. And yeah, we can give it all this context and talk about his teammates and talk about this and that. But I do think that that's still a vital piece to his profile and that he needed that. And that's a year that, yes, his age is his age, but that's still an extra season of collegiate football that Marvin Harrison and Malik neighbors never had. And so I do think we have to at least, you know, that that's that's basically the main reason that I have a Dunze below those two guys. I mean, the the other two are better in the prospect model and like that's what separates them for sure in, in a more concrete way. But at the same time, I, I do think that it's easy to just be like, yeah, he got an extra year to produce like that. That's fine for me to say I'm going to separate them, put them in his own tier and say that Malik neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. are just better prospects. But you know, I'm not gonna be shocked if a Dunze balls out because I think he is a very, very good prospect. He'd probably be, you know, the wide receiver one in most other classes. But a guy that I just brought brought up was A.D. Mitchell, where, you know, Mitchell is declaring or he has like a, an opposite. It's like if if Roma Dunze would have come out last year and and had, I guess, worse, you know, production metrics, uh, you know, across the board. But, you know, Mitchell's coming out early and he has some of the worst age adjusted metrics that you'll find from like a first round wide receiver. I brought this up on the show plenty of times. Worst yards per route run, best season yards per route run in this year's class. Uh, if he gets drafted in the first round, which is looking more and more likely, he'll have the worst yards per route run since PFF started charting, uh, which goes back to 2014. He'll have the worst yards per route run of any first round wide receiver in that time frame. And he's like half a yard lower than Zay Flowers, who was the next one on that list. Like it's, it's just, it's rough. Like he, he does not have, it's hard to paint this as Adonai Mitchell has a good production profile, right? Like his production profile is bad, but you have that wide receiver five at the moment. So talk to me about AD Mitchell, make sort of the bull case for him. Yeah. I mean, I, everything you said is, is concerning. And, I, and when I started this, I actually had him a little lower, but I, as I was kind of going through this, I'm like, okay, like from a height, weight, speed perspective, he's really good compared to a lot of the guys that are below him. You know, like uh, when I think about like Lad McConkey and uh, Troy Franklin, and, and then, you know, obviously you go further down the board. I'm like, I don't know if any of those guys I could forecast as being like the top dog for their team mm -hmm. and having a high ceiling. And I think that Mitchell has that ceiling. I, I think his like range of outcomes is just super, super wide. And when I look at this class, so obviously it's going to be a great, it's going to be a great case that I'm, I'm going to make the case for AD Mitchell without even really talking about AD Mitchell. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's always a good sign. Um, but like, because the top of the class is so good, you're kind of not paying the premium that you would for the ceiling in a previous year. So, mm -hmm. you know, if he's a, a late first round rookie pick or an early second round rookie pick, like that's kind of awesome for the ceiling, you know, yeah. and, and that pick, and he's going to miss a lot, but a lot of those picks in that range are going to miss a lot. Um, you know, if this was, if this was last year and he was like a top five pick, I would be out. But I, I think that from a, I think the cost is something that makes me want to be a buyer just because I feel like I'm still getting kind of a discount historically. Yeah. And if you look at his profile, yes, there's, you know, I mentioned all the things that are wrong with it. His breakout score 41.8 when sub 60 breakout scores in the first round historically, literally every single one of them are busts. Like, like every single one since 2011. And, and all that's bad, right? I, I did have the galaxy brain. Maybe he's just an outlier already, right? Like, like he's the, the fact that this profile of that, that's this bad is getting drafted in round one. He's already kind of an outlier. So why can't he just continue down that path? Right. But I'll take a step back a little bit. And to your point about this class in general, you get past AD Mitchell. You know, I like Xavier worthy a lot. Like I, I I'm probably, yeah. you know, let's say worthy goes if worthy goes late first, like to me, he'll, he'll be locked in after like a Brian Thomas in, in my opinion, but then, you know, AD Mitchell after a Xavier worthy where worthy has, you know, worthy still has some concerning marks to his profile. Don't get me wrong. Like there's, you know, his production didn't get any better after his freshman year. That's, a, that's somewhat of a red flag. Obviously there's some size concerns, but after you get worthy, let's say, let's just give him the benefit of the doubt you get to a group of players, like you said, where there's just a lot of question marks. Like this isn't like, 
we're sitting here and talking about flawless prospect after flawless prospect where, you know, Troy Franklin, uh, you know, didn't have much competition uh, where he was playing. And he's also probably not like a true X number one kind of prototype prototypical wide receiver. Uh, he's probably not gonna play that role and maybe not command a high target share as a result of that. To me, he's like a Jamison Williams type. Right. And then, you know, Lad McConkey to your point, like, is he going to be that dude, uh, you know, at the NFL level, or is he going to be more of a compliment? I think throughout the second round, you're littered with a lot of these like complimentary, really good players who could be wide receiver twos in fantasy, but do they truly have that ceiling of being a wide receiver one? And then I have, so I have that on one side and then the other side, I'm always like, we're really bad at projecting floor and ceiling, you know, like we're really like, yeah. like, so, so I'm like going back and forth, but I think because of all that, um, you know, I'm going to rely on the model a lot and know that AD Mitchell going in the first round matters to, to a, a large degree. Like that's a big deal if he gets first round draft capital. And to me, this is why I have a prospect model. It's to guide me. It's to say, okay, yes, he has these concerning marks, but how much should we weigh these things? Like how, how big of a deal, you know, is this when in conjunction with draft capital, especially against other players in the draft? Because Look, at the end of the day, Lad McConkey's breakout score sucks too because he didn't yeah. he didn't run enough routes at Georgia. So I do think Mitchell's going to be really interesting. And the one thing that I and I'd love to hear what you think about this. We live in this fantasy football world where a lot of the drafts that we'll have, a lot of these rookie drafts are gonna whether you're in drafts with people who aren't analysts or are analysts, like you and I play in dynasty leagues together and such, and we're in a lot of like analyst leagues and such, where we know people are gonna be pretty analytically minded. And so it wouldn't shock me if A.D. Mitchell falls in some of those drafts just because they know the production profile is not there. But then even like a home league rookie draft, they're going to get advice from analysts who are thinking numbers driven. And if that's the case, then A.D. Mitchell may fall a little bit in those dra- in some of those drafts. I'm not saying all there's probably going to be a Mitchell truther in most of these drafts, but there's going to be some where he falls. Do you agree with that? That like that's where we can get some exposure to the guy? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, this is kind of like the. uh like the George Pickens, the Christian Watson, like I, I feel like mm-hmm. those guys a couple of years ago, it was easy to look at them and say no. Um, and I mean, I guess we'll see with Watson. I, I think Pickens yeah. is probably pretty good, but like there's opportunities, like just because someone has red flags or someone has a reason where you wouldn't draft them doesn't mean that you should just never draft them at all. Right, right. It's it's all about where what the cost is, right? And like what, what, what the market is really saying about these guys. Um, one of the more aggressive rankings that I saw throughout your list was Johnny Wilson, who you mentioned. He was slotted in at wide receiver seven, which is, dude, I'll tell you what. I do this prospect guide. I launched it at the beginning of March, and there were two guys this year where I wish I was a little bit bolder in the way that I spoke about them in the guide. One of them was Johnny Wilson because some of his peripheral numbers were really interesting, and you can get into that and talk about him. And then the other one was was Tyrone Tracy. Um who, you know, is that like hybrid came from you know, played wide receiver, went to running back because he comped to Tony Pollard in the model. But I, I was just I was kind of dismissive about those guys. And then over the last like month and a half, they're getting a little bit more steam. People, more and more people are talking about them. Smart people are talking about them. And it's getting me a little bit excited. Like like the Johnny Wilson train is really intriguing to me. But tell me and, and tell folks why why you seem to like him more than others. I mean, I'm just obsessed with this, with this dude. Like, I, I just feel like when we, when I first started doing this, we loved the big receivers, you know, yes. like big, fast guys, like give me, give me, give me. Now, I mean, the little guys have like taken over, you know, like uh, there's nothing wrong with them, but like this, this guy is a freak show. And when I looked at his athleticism and like, you know, the stuff on mock draft and all that, I was like blown away at, at how he, he, how he was in those metrics, because I think that like the first thing we think of, especially when you look at the school he's coming from is Kelvin Benjamin. Mm -hmm. But like this dude is way more athletic than Kelvin Benjamin, like a a 10th of a second faster in the 40, like a 10th of a second faster in the shuttle. Like if you're looking at his athletic profile, like he's really more in that, like Mike Evans, Brandon Marshall territory. And I mean, those players were good. You know, obviously not saying that that means that Johnny Wilson is good, but like, it, it's not prohibitive at least, you know, yeah. where I feel like people were kind of talking about him as like, Oh, he should go be a tight end or he's too stiff. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Is he? Because he doesn't really test like it. And like he did play like four years as a college wide receiver. Yeah. Um, and he produced head to head against other good players in this class. Like, 
he was at Arizona State for like a second with Ricky Pearsall during the COVID year, and 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 he outgained him. Um, you know, obviously he played with Keon Coleman this year, and like Coleman on the year did better than him. But if you look at just the common games, Wilson outgained him in those games, six hundred seventeen yards to four hundred fifty two. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, okay, so like we have this player who's like truly like a one of a kind athlete. Like there's just not many guys like him. Um, and when he was presented with target challenges from other good players, he was the winner there. So, uh, you know, I know he doesn't have like the traditional breakout stats that we like, but I just find myself kind of gravitating to him again as like being someone who like, I could just see like the inputs just not really working for a guy like him. Yeah. And, and he, he ends up being a very good player. Yeah. I also think that players like this could potentially go down like a, like a chase Claypool kind of trajectory where like, I'm not saying that he's going to just turn to dust the way that chase Claypool (laughs) did, but like where, where, where if you're making the investment in dynasty, you could have, because he's a specimen, right. And like teams and defenses might not be prepared for the specimen. And the offense might be able to use him in more creative ways as a result, maybe as a rookie. And then we see crazy rookie season numbers like we did with Chase Claypool. And then you have a decision to make. Like, are you going to invest further or are you going to to sell? But at least you, you know, gain value from year one to year two with that player. That's kind of the way that I'm viewing Wilson. Now, you know, I don't know what kind of draft capital he'll end up getting. Uh, It sounds like it could be day two, like, like later day two, but Uh, If that happens, you know, the other thing you mentioned, like Pearsall and Keon Coleman, like if Keon Coleman goes in the beginning of the second round or somehow sneaks into the late first round, that's signal that's better signal for Johnny Wilson, right? That, that like Wilson was competing alongside that and basically put up comparable numbers to, to some degree. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, he's going to look a lot better because he was doing that with a late first round pick and same, same deal with Ricky Pearsall. So I like it. I like the boldness of having Wilson there. Um, you know, I know that you obviously are going to look at landing spot and draft capital after the fact, but I like that, uh, you know, you have like your guy that's sta- standing out and like really sticks out whenever you look at the rankings, but I understand it. Like, I think that, that he is someone who probably is a little bit undervalued and he was undervalued even the way that I ranked him, you know, once the prospect guide came out. Let's talk about a player who I have more issues with than I think you do, and that's Malachi Corley. He's your wide receiver eight. Um, I just have some analytical concerns, uh, but but talk to me about Malachi Corley because he's gotten a lot of, you know, he's got some do- that dog in him. Uh, he gets the, the Debo Samuel comp a lot. Is that what you're seeing in Corley? Yeah, I mean, the Debo thing was kind of funny because that is something that you hear like the scouts say, uh, like Lance Earline, like directly comped him to Debo. Um, so it's not like even just people like on Twitter, it's like actual people who like do yeah, this yeah. for a living smart, or making smart. that comp. Yeah. And that, that does matter to me, but like Debo also came up in his comps. So when that happens, I usually just give it a little extra weight because I'm like, okay, like I, I, I do genuinely enjoy when the numbers and the film kind of align. Sure. Um, I know Steve Smith really likes him and I have a lot of respect for where he thinks about the receiver position. So, you know, I, I think that it's difficult sometimes to evaluate these guys. I, I think Zay Flowers is kind of like a good, like recent player to kind of look at where it's like, Oh, your team sucks. Like, yeah. <laughs> like your team is terrible. You're the offense. You're just getting pelted with these like low eight dot targets. And it's hard to tell like, if you're a good player or if you're just the best of a bad bunch, you right, know? And right. um, I guess I just try to lean a little bit more towards the positive and the upside because again, like the penalty for missing, I think on, on most of these guys is actually very small. Like I, there's only so many really good players in the class. And I, I think for the most part, like you're going to shuffle through a lot of these guys. Like I, I want to find the guys who can be top 20 dynasty receivers. Like that, that's what I want. Yeah. And, you know, when I see a guy like Corley, I see the path because we know that he can get the ball in a variety of ways. We know that, you know, at least one team has already decided, like, we have to kind of just move everything over and give the ball to him. Um, and so when I match that up with what some of the other smart people are saying, that, that's where I lean into the more positive aspect. Now, like, obviously, like, this guy has warts, you know, like, the first yeah. time you look at him, you're like, oh, my gosh, I don't know if I can necessarily get around, like him being a good player. But I, again, like it's kind of like a, what you win when you win type deal for me with Corley. 
Yeah, look, I, I understand the upside for sure. And Debo was a was a comp for me as well. My thing has been, you know, he played at Western Kentucky, right? And yeah. at Western Kentucky, his yards per team pass attempts was still pretty poor. Like wasn't really that much over two. Uh, you know, when when you know, for a guy at a smaller school, you almost need that to be over the three mark, right? And then I do adjustments based on program strength. Program strength isn't really there. And then when you do that, his breakout score ends up being zero because he just doesn't hit any of the thresholds because of the because of the adjustments that are being made. And so, you know, I, I but I totally get what you're saying where investment wise, you know, there's not that like, yeah, he's a volatile investment. But if you're going to spend a mid second, probably in super flex on him to, to late second, if he goes in the second round or third round, you know, day two pick, um, you know, that's that's not that significant of an investment to like take a chance and see you know, if a team can use him creatively, I think he's one of those players though, where he needs to find that spot. Like oh, yeah. one of the, one of the, uh, I think like you might've thrown this comp out too, that he could be like a Rasheed Rice type, right? Yeah. Where you, you have like this yak monster guy that can catch the ball really close to the line of scrimmage, which is exactly what he did at Western Kentucky. Like he got peppered with targets behind the line of scrimmage, uh, screens, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and look, that's, that doesn't tell us that he can't do the other things. I think it just tells us that we don't know fully, right? Yeah. The thing with Rasheed Rice, I don't know if Rice has the rookie season that he has outside of Kansas City. Right? Yeah. Like and it's super fair. I mean, <laughs> right? Like like I I don't know, I don't know if Rasheed Rice is Rasheed Rice on the field, of course, uh outside of of that environment where Kansas City gave him those low A dot looks, a lot of screens, a lot of those easy catches, let him do his work after the catch, if Corley can find a spot like that where he can get peppered, yeah, I see it totally because he is great at, at breaking tackles. You know, he is great at playing that kind of role. I just, I think my hesitation is let's, I want to see where the landing spot is because I don't know if I have confidence in enough teams out there to be able to do that properly and, and efficiently yeah. and effectively, if that makes sense. This episode is sponsored by Underdog Fantasy. I know a lot of you guys already play over there, but if you don't, you definitely have to check out their best ball drafts. You draft a team, which is honestly the best part of fantasy football, and then that's it. There's no trading, no waiver wire, no lineup setting. Your roster is optimized each week based on player performance. I'm going to be doing a lot of content on best ball this season, so make sure you're signed up and ready to draft for when that content drops. Just head to underdogfantasy.com or download the Underdog Fantasy app. And when you sign up, make sure you use promo code late round to get a deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's promo code late round. Lad McConkey. So Lad McConkey, uh, he's a bit lower in your rankings than most. Yeah. Is that because he's a four year guy? Didn't really see breakout. Like, like what is it about McConkey that you're not that into? Yes. I mean, it's just like all of it. Like I, yeah. I just, the Georgia guys are like tough enough as it is to me, you know, like they yeah. really don't produce, especially with Bowers there who to just take so much work. It's like evaluating these guys, I think becomes really difficult. Um, and then the fact that he is an older player, he's a smaller player. Um, and he's someone who's already had an injury history. Like he was pretty much hurt like all of 2022, but played through it. And then last year he missed, I want to say five games with an injury. Like, is that going to be an issue too? Like where he's just dinged up all the time. Like it just, you know, he's a guy where the numbers aren't going to like him for the reasons that we kind of stated in terms of the age and all that. Um, but like the, the difference between him and like an AD Mitchell or, you know, one of those guys we've already talked about is just that like, I just don't see the, the ceiling. Like, I'm not sure what I'm getting here. Like, am I getting Doug Baldwin? Mm -hmm. Because if I'm getting Doug Baldwin, I, I, kind of need Russell Wilson, you know, like, yeah. Um, so I, I just, I worry about this, you know, I mean, he, he was a, a pure red shirt in 2020. Like didn't even see the field at all. Uh, and the guys who did get on the field, you know, Jermaine Burton, Kiaris Jackson, George Pickens, like, I, I'm not sure how good those guys are, you know, like, I don't know right. how good Jermaine Burton is. Right. Um, so I, I just, there's just too much going on there where I'm just, I'd rather just stay away because I, I'm not sure what I'm getting if he is good. And I, I'm not really, it's hard to quantify it if he even will be. 
Yeah, I think there's just like this massive tier of players after, again, like for me, it's the worthy mark. You know, it could be the AD Mitchell mark, depending on his draft capital. But like there's all of these guys like a Troy Franklin, who I think has I like I'd probably prefer Franklin over McConkey just because there's a better baseline for, for production there. But like, you know, McConkey, the one thing that's bringing me in is the yards per route run is that he has the six best in the class among combine invites. And that includes guys who went to small schools where they should have, you know, higher yards per route run rates just because the, the competition is inferior. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it plays into like Georgia's game script. McConkie might not being a hundred percent, all that kind of stuff and him running the fifth most routes on Georgia this past year. And so you can at least like tell yourself somewhat of a story, but I think I generally agree where like, there's this massive tier and I'd rather be drafting at the bottom of that tier, you know, to extract as much value as possible, as opposed to spending a late first on McConkey when I could get a uh, player X, you know, in the mid second who probably has a similar range of outcomes, like from a fantasy perspective. So I, I totally feel you and, and understand that concern. Uh, let's move on to running back. You know, you have a, a pretty interesting RB one tier. It seems like that was formed of Jalen Wright, Blake Corm, and Jonathan Brooks. When a lot of people would place, Trey Benson in there. Do you have any issues with, with Benson's profile? What separates sort of the other three guys more and above Benson? Yeah, I think the thing that keeps Benson out for me, uh, well, I mean, I guess it's a couple of things. Like first he had a super, super major injury like early in his college career. Yeah. Um, so we just haven't seen a lot of him. And I think that that kind of paints the picture for me in a way where I'm like, well, I just feel very uncertain, you know, um, he was not a workhorse. So it's not like, you know, in the case of Brooks, he did not play a lot. Like he is not a, a high usage player for the majority of his career, but like in his last year he was right. And Benson wasn't. So there's just not really a lot of guys like him. Now he is bigger. Like he's over 215 pounds. He, he ran the sub four, four forty. That's like generally a pretty good group. So there's reasons to like him. I just, the durability stuff and the draft position where like, I think for this class as a whole, like majority of these guys are going to be round three and later. Yeah. So how much work are you really guaranteed to get? Um, and when I can't really rely on you to be like a, a huge volume player, I really need you to be a home run hitter. And I'm not positive that he's that either. Uh, on as consistent a basis as like Jalen Wright. Cause I thought Jalen Wright, like, again, was another guy who's not a workhorse, but I thought that the explosive stuff mm -hmm. was way better. Yeah. Um, so that's why I have him higher. Uh, and then Corm and, and Brooks for me are just guys who like, they could be workhorses. You know right. I mean? Like Blake Corm, Blake Corm without the injury at the end of 2022, I think would be like considered way better. And like, obviously would be, would just, look a lot better. Like his draft position would probably be projected to be higher, all that stuff. Cause I, I think he's awesome, you yeah. know? Um, but it's just a matter of like, are we going to get that Blake Corm again? Or are we going to get what we had last year at Michigan where clearly he was kind of like missing that, that last year and, and missing kind of what he had the year before. So I'm uh, again, like I'm kind of playing for this, for the ceiling here. Benson just like, I, I just feel like Benson's going to be like a part-time guy who doesn't score touchdowns and doesn't do, you know, like I, there's just so many ways for him to not really be a productive NFL back where I'm like, okay, like I just want to take a little bit of a stand here and put him a little bit lower uh, than the, that, that group of guys that you mentioned. I like the point that you made about these guys likely like chances are, I, I do. When do you think the first running back is going to get drafted? Let's, let's start there. Like what, if you were to say, you can even say by round, you don't say like by pick or anything like that, but do you think the first running back goes off the board in round three? Like, I think like late second round to Dallas is like the first chance that yeah. you're going to get. Yeah. And that's because they have like a glaring need. Right. Right. And, and I, I would agree. Like, I think that's, that's like the spot. Like if one of these guys goes there, I think that, you know, combining, oh. yeah, combining draft capital, combining all that, then we're like, okay, he's, he's the RB one in this class. But uh, I, I think from that perspective though, like, let's say that all these guys go in round three or later, then it's sort of like a choose your own adventure in my opinion of like yeah. what you like prospecting and what you like out of a running back, because once you get to that point in time, especially like late third into day three, there's not that big of a difference in ability and in fantasy production out of those players. Like round two is the sweet spot. Like you want these guys, if they're really going to be difference makers 
to go in round two. And then you start to see this drop off. And so if that's the case, if you believe that, then you can really go by who you just feel is most talented as opposed to really weighing draft capital heavily. Obviously, I have my model that's going to help me like figure that stuff out. But I'm saying anyone out there who's just sort of like trying to figure out who you should be drafting, uh, don't weigh draft. Like just because the guy's in RB1 in his class does not mean that he will automatically be good. Uh, you know, if he's getting like, or, or, or the RB2 in his class who's getting, uh, right. you know, round three or late round three capital. I think it's really, really important to make that point. You're, you're one of the few people though that I feel like is not very high on Trey Benson. Uh, it seems like everyone has them, has him. And I, I've played it safe to be, to be clear with Benson where I'm like, I think the draft capital is probably gonna be a little bit better than like a Jalen Wright, but looking at some like mock draft and NFL mock draft database and such like Jalen Wright's been rising ever since I made, you know, those yeah. initial rankings and like other guys are sort of like creeping in and it's making me want to go that route a little bit more as opposed to Trey Benson, because there's a lot of flags to his profile that, uh, you know, I just don't like, like if you look at day two backs who have as poor of a breakout score and a sub 10% best season reception share, which is definitely something you don't want out of a running back. There's, there's literally no hits on day two. And there's like a group of like 10 running backs that have, that have sort of been in that archetype and, and been, been with those, uh, thresholds. And so I'm a little concerned from that perspective. Do you think Jonathan Brooks without the ACL would be your clear cut RB one? Maybe. I, I I don't know. I, I go back and forth on this with Leone all the time because that's where he's he comes from that perspective where he's like, you know, if he wasn't injured, what would you think of him? And I and I guess like I would have him consider I guess I would have him higher just because if he didn't have the ACL, I'd just feel way better about him being a, a, a round two guy instead of the potential that he falls into round three. Right. Um, and maybe I should just already have him higher just because like, I feel like he's projected so frequently to go to Dallas where it's like, maybe I should just get ahead of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the injury is definitely the thing that keeps him like kind of in that group. Um, and, and like, I mean, he really was only a one year producer. That's kind of the, the other thing too, where I'm like, I, there's great reasons for that. I mean, like you play with B. John Robinson, like you are not yeah. seeing the and field. Roshan Johnson. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But yeah. it's just like, I, I, but like, I just don't know, you know, like yeah. it's, it's kind of like an unseen thing yeah. for me. So yeah, that, that, totally. that, that, that's kind of why I have him like in that group instead of like at the top or above that group. Yeah, no, it's, it's totally fair. I, and I also think that like, and I bring this up all the time, but like from a game theory perspective, we can't just dismiss the ACL, right? Like, yeah. like if the dude doesn't play for, or doesn't get a lot of work for the front half of his rookie year, or maybe he just doesn't get a ton of work throughout his rookie season, then all of a sudden you're sitting after year one and you're going to say to yourself, okay, I have Jonathan Brooks on my dynasty roster. Okay, great. You can say to yourself and sell to yourself all day long that, oh, he just didn't produce because of the ACL. But in the back of your mind, you know that year one production matters a lot from a predictability standpoint and predictiveness standpoint. And if he doesn't have that, then you're going to still question it, right? Like you're going to still question what's going to happen moving forward with Brooks. So I do think that that's still in the back of my mind. I I'm, I'm now officially on Brooks RB one, but I, you know, understand the hesitation a lot. Cause I have plenty of hesitation with it. And Jalen Wright has been someone that's been rising for me a ton, you know, during this process where like from a fantasy perspective, you can see him at the very least being in a, in a tandem as sort of the lightning, right? In, in that tandem. And then what if there's an injury or what if he just overtakes that backfield and is able to showcase talent, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'm, I'm liking Wright a lot more just because of that, that speed profile, that, that explosiveness profile. Um, let's move on to the tight end class. Do you have, uh, you know, any favorites in this class? How many do you think end up getting take? Obviously Brock Bauer is going to go day one, but how many do you think end up going day two? So I think that there's like five guys maybe with a chance. We probably only get like two, mm -hmm. but like Jatavian Sanders and Ben Sino, I think are probably the favorites to be like the next couple tight ends off the board. Uh, and then Theo Johnson, Jaheim Bell and, and Kate Stover, I think have a chance. I don't know if it's a great chance, although uh, Charles Robinson from Yahoo said today that a lot of teams have Theo Johnson as their tight end too. So that, mm -hmm. that made me feel I think a lot better um, because as with all Penn state guys, he has a great athletic profile. Yeah. Right. yeah you go to um, Penn state, you're an athlete. Yeah. So yeah. So I, and there's like some kind of like fun guys here. Like, I don't really know 
if I'm going to feel great about drafting any of them before like the third round of rookie drafts, if it's super flex, but again, like athletically, like Sino is really good. Jaheim Bell, like is just like a yak monster, like yeah, has more like, yak than Bowers yeah. per catch, which is like really difficult to do. Um, Johnson, like we said, as an athlete, but the guy that like way further down the board that I'm like obsessed with is tip Ryman from okay. Illinois. Okay. This guy is 271 pounds and he runs like a four, six. And I'm just like, <laughs> I'd like to big guy run fast. It's just like the easiest way into sure. my heart. Like I just, you know, because he's someone who, even if he's like a round four pick, I could see getting on the field immediately because he can block. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like what holds a lot of these younger tight ends back is the, the blocking and the physical nature. Um, you know, blocking those NFL defensive ends, stuff like that. So if he can get on the field, like he, he has the athletic profile to be like, not like an elite tier tight end, I guess, but just like someone who is not going to be easy to tackle, catch the ball in the red zone. Like, I don't know the threshold for like being a productive fantasy tight end is very low. Yeah. So I, I just feel like he's kind of a guy that like just on high weight speed, I, I have to buy a little bit. Yeah, Theo Johnson too. I mean, un- I mean, his athleticism is like out of this world. His his uh, production profile is pretty crappy, but the the athleticism is just like insanity. Jaheim Bell is one that uh, I I wish he was like just a little bit. It's like Skilo's song. I, I wish he was a little bit taller. I wish he was a little bit bigger. <laughs> Uh, I, it would be nice to, to have like a more prototypical size from him because I really like his production profile and, uh, you know, he had that, he had a pretty good speed score too, uh, when it was all said and done, but we'll see. I, I like the, the call that we'll probably see a couple day two tight ends. That's an interesting nugget about Theo Johnson too, because my model right now has Johnson at barely, barely, but it has him at tight end too, just because of the athleticism. But I don't. I don't think I'm going to necessarily rank him that way when it's all said and done, just because number one, I don't know if that, if he gets the capital, but uh, also the production profile is just really not that strong. Um, You've also been someone, this is very random, but I want to hear your thoughts. Jaquan Jackson. um, Talk to me about him, man. This is, this is my guy. I I don't know. Like, again, like I, I didn't realize that I was like on a bubble on this until like, people kept bringing it up to me like, Oh, you like Jaquan Jackson? Like, I don't even know who that is. I'm like, Oh, great. Um, again, not a great start. And like, he's probably someone who goes on day three, but he's Ed Reed's nephew. Like (laughs) he has the hall of fame bloodlines again. Um, but he was also a second year breakout at Tulane. So I kind of, when I first started looking at him, I immediately thought of Jaden Reed where I'm like, you know, He had the early breakout. Then he was hurt a lot. That's kind of the Jaquan Jackson story. Like just really struggled with injuries and he is smaller. Like this guy's going to have to be a slot. He's not going to be able to be an outside target, but everyone seemed to really like him at the senior bowl, the senior week. He, he was a standout there at the practices. Um, and the game was like kind of a a mess, but just, you know, the practices I think are usually, usually what matter. Um, so like if I'm going to take a guy, late if there's a dart that i'm trying to throw like again give me the guy who's like a solid athlete actually has decent age adjusted production just because he broke out a young at a young age even though he was in college for a while um and is probably gonna get a a shot i mean like for no other reason the fact that his uncle is who he is like i I feel like he's gonna at least get a chance yeah he's also someone who has a you know to to your Jaden reed point he's someone who has that like all around profile like he's got a lot of rushing work and stuff and and can play that way which is signal that the dude is getting the ball in his hands in more creative ways because the team wants the ball in his hands so uh yeah definitely jaquan jackson out of tulane everyone should at least be aware of him late late in your rookie drafts that's an amico special right there uh but i want to i want to end this with aside from jackson uh, what other under the radar prospect do you think that that fantasy gamers should be more concerned about? You can name more than one or just one doesn't matter. Ooh, um, there's three guys I really like. All right, let's, I don't hear know. <laughs> let's hear it. Um, Dylan, Dylan Laub or Lobby. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, this is probably like a this is like the hipster pick. I feel like because <laughs> he's like 25, but every every like nerd loves this guy. I feel like or at least should because he yeah. caught so many passes. Like, yeah, it's amazing. You know, lacrosse guy. Awesome three cone, six, eight, four. Uh, he's like actually like decently big, like he's two Oh six. So 
again, like we kind of talked about like where these running backs are going to go. Like I could absolutely see him carving, carving out a role where PPR leagues where we're kind of, we're kind of balling. Yeah. For um, sure. and then at receiver, uh, Anias Smith from Texas. Yeah. A&M. Love that call. Yeah. He's, he's very fun. Like, again, like he played a little bit of running back, um, in his second season. And I, I think it really cost him like a breakout. Like I, I, as a receiver, he was doing really well. And then it was, it was like, Oh, well, Devon, a chains hurt like shocker. Um, you know, you have to play some running back. So he didn't get like the receiving numbers that he probably would have gotten otherwise. So if, if I cheat a little bit and I credit him with the, yeah, with the breakout in year two, which I, I love to do, um, he gets like some really good comps, like even as a day three pick, like Amon Ra, Jaden Reed, Christian Kirk, um, USC, Steve Smith, like there, there's paths I feel like to production here. Mm-hmm. Um, he's like another guy that like with the ball has at least proven that he can, he can make some things happen. And then the last guy, Luke McCaffrey out of rice. I mean, yeah. it's just, just, just McCaffrey. Sure. You know, yeah, like, bloodline. Yeah. um, really never played receiver at all. Like he was a high school quarterback. He was a college quarterback. So even though he's a late breakout, he's kind of like, I don't, and I don't know how to quantify this, but it's like, he's, he's an early breakout as a receiver. Yeah. Like he just hasn't done it. And like immediately he's, he's absorbing targets immediately. He's the top guy and he's productive. So like, I just feel like that bodes really well. Um, and he, and again, like he's another one of those senior ball guys where like, if he snuck into the tail end of the third round, it wouldn't shock me. Mm. Um, but like, if not, he's by round four. So I, there's, there's reasons I feel like where he could end up being like a pretty good player. Yeah. I like the, the McCaffrey call out. Uh, you know, like you said, he plays quarterback and then doesn't play that much wide receiver, but when he played wide out, he actually didn't have terrible numbers. Uh, the Anaya Smith one, love that as well. Curtis Samuel was the, the top comp for me for him uh you know that that sort of hybrid kind of player uh that can do it all but i you know i obviously he's playing wide receiver at the nfl level he's also a matt waldman special is anaya smith so that's a, a good combo of of sort of analytics and film um and then dylan lauby we got i mean look the dude has the highest best season reception share in my database so yeah <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a sucker i'm a sucker for pass catching backs man i'm gonna i'm gonna get him an all my, my only thing is that he is such a hipster pick that we're going to, he's going to be like a early third rounder in, in yeah. super. And like, you can't do that if he's going to be like a seventh round pick or something like I know. that. You know? I was snooping on Kareem's rankings like a couple of weeks ago and he had him so high. I'm like, crap. My yeah. Yeah. Like, right. You know, right. Like, exactly. Exactly. It's like, we're not, we're not going to be able to get like round five Dylan Lowby in our rookie drafts, which sucks. Uh, <laughs> but Amico, man, it was great to talk to you. Why don't you let everyone know, know where they can find you? Yeah. You can find me on Twitter at Amixta. And, uh, you know, we got all the dynasty stuff going on at ETR. So check that out. Obviously we'll update everything after the draft. And, uh, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun, man. This is a, this is a great year for rookie drafts. Great year to have multiple picks. So it's going to be a great time. Yeah, I agree. It's going to be one of those years where it's gonna, you know, you, you get to really choose the guys that, uh, you know, your process leads you to, as opposed to just kind of letting draft capital take the wheel and just being like, well, I got to take this guy because he's a first round pick versus a third round pick. Um, I, I think it's gonna be a really, really interesting time. As always, though, you guys can follow me on Twitter at late round QB. Check out the late round prospect guide over on late round.com. I will have the updated guide out for you guys on Saturday night. I promise you when the draft is over, just give me a little bit of time to fully update things. I'll be updating as the draft goes on, but to fully update things, you will have it in your hands on Saturday night because I know that you guys are going to be doing your rookie drafts almost immediately after. But this is the last you'll hear my voice until next week. So everyone enjoy the draft. Amico, you enjoy the draft as well. I know it's going to be a stressful, tilting and entertaining time. Uh, But otherwise, everyone, thank you for tuning in.